Welcome everyone to the Native Farm Bill Coalition's third webinar focusing today on the credit title, the rural development title, and the research title of the Farm Bill. Thank you for joining us um, and we hope that you've enjoyed some of our webinars earlier and uh, this is our one of our last webinars on the uh, specifics of the Farm Bill. Looks like we're having a bit of technical difficulties here. Here we go. Um, welcome and introduction. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Maria Givens. I'm a member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe from Northern Idaho, and I'm a policy analyst here at NCAI handling agriculture and telecommunications. Um, and today we're joined by Chris Georgikis, uh, the president of Goff Public, representing the Shakti Mitawakadan Sioux community, myself, uh, Ross Racine, the Executive Director of the Intertribal Agriculture Council, Zach Ducheneau, Program Manager and Secretary of the Intertribal Agriculture Council, uh, Phil Bakershank, Partner at Holland and Knight, working with Shock Team in Wakadin, um, and Jamie Sims Hip and Colby Duran, both of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Um, the Native Farm Bill Coalition really started with the Regaining Our Future report uh, that was commissioned by the Shakopee, Mitawakan, and Sioux community and was released at the NCAI Mid-Year Conference um, in June 2017. Uh, in this report, um, it really emphasized the importance of the Farm Bill to Indian Country and how specific programs and uh, areas within the Farm Bill can be um, changed and utilized to really help out tribes, tribal organizations, and um, really highlighted the opportunities for um, this next reauthorization of the Farm Bill. Um, it's available online at the seedsofnativehealth.org uh, website, and um, it's a great resource, and uh, there's a lot to learn in that report. And uh, stemming from that report, we've uh, put together some uh, one-pagers and summaries, um, really outlining the legislative fixes uh, and legislative priorities of the coalition. About the Native Farm Bill Coalition, um, it was established in October 2017 at the NCAI Annual Conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, it's co-chaired by Keith Anderson, the Vice, Pair of the, Vice Chair of the Shakopee Midwakad and Sioux Community, and Ross Racine, the Executive Director of Intertribal Agriculture Council. Uh, NCAI is a founding partner with Shakopee, uh, Intertribal Ag and uh, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative uh, that's acting as a research partner in this effort. Um, so far, over 40 Native nations have passed resolutions to join the coalition. Um, and we're looking for more, more tribes who want to um, get involved in, this, in the work that we're doing, uh, including these webinars and including advocating to Congress, because Congress at the end of the day is going to be the one who passes the next Farm Bill. Um, for more information, um, if your tribe would like to join, uh, we ask you to pass a tribal resolution, send a logo and uh, some contact information to uh, info at nativefarmbillcoalition.org. Um, you'll be able to provide input, get the latest updates and receive information from the coalition, including uh, legislative papers, um, talking points, one-pagers, and data specific to your community. Um, we actually have a few events coming up. Um, in the past, we had two webinars on December 18th and January 8th. Um, those webinars can be viewed um, on the Seeds of Native Health website and on NCAI's YouTube page. Um, in upcoming events, uh, there will be a Farm Bill session at NCAI's Executive Council Winter Session. It'll be on uh, February 12th from 1.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, it'll be in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol Hilton, and uh, we're really going to focus on how we can advocate to Congress and use our time in Washington, D.C. wisely to make sure that Indian country is included in this Farm Bill. Um, our next webinar is going to be during the week of February 19th. 
And we're going to focus on the congressional actions, uh, the hearing and roundtable that happened at the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs last week, and uh, priorities and development and focusing on your input. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to Colby Dern of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Colby? Thank you, Maria. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Colby Darn. I'm the policy director and one of the staff attorneys uh, with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, for if this is your, if this is um, um, the third webinar that you've uh, joined us all on. Then this might sound a little familiar. And I'm going to go through this part of it pretty quickly. And I would just say for some of the more in, uh, uh, more in depth information on this, uh, I would I would check uh, the YouTube link that we should have available for our, at least our first and our second webinar to talk about this. So um, this is just generally about the farm bill um, and what the farm bill has. The farm bill itself has really uh, been described probably uh, best by President Obama, which is uh, who was uh, uh, who was the president the last time it was passed. It's really a Swiss Army knife. It can cover so many different things, including infrastructure, conservation. Um, uh, uh, research, jobs, innovation, the farm food safety net provides food assistance, health and nutrition, and really has a large em uh, uh, emphasis on, on, on pretty much a majority of programs which impact a lot of Americans, particularly uh, folks in rural parts of the country. If you can please go to the next slide. So the last time the farm bill was passed, uh, it was passed in 2014, as I said. Uh, it's a five-year bill, so they need to reauthorize it every five years. Um, it expires this this September uh, um, coming up, and so the con Congress right now, as we'll be talking about, is looking to reauthorize it. As you can see, some of the breakdown of the bill, about 80% of that is, uh, is, is funding for nutrition programs, and particularly the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, uh, which is uh, formerly called the Food Stamp Program. In our first webinar, we go into a really great detail and focus on the nutrition title and that. And so, we'll refer you to that for a larger discussion of that. And you can see some of the other breaks down, the breakdowns of conservation, crop insurance, and commodities. We talked a lot about conservation in our second webinar. Um, so, I would I would refer to that as as that's also a very sizable part of the budget of the farm bill. Um, so, if you can please go to the next slide, uh, Maria. So why does the farm bill matter? You know, as a as a five year bill, I was last passed it was four hundred and uh, four hundred and fifty six billion uh, billion dollars. And when they did the projection at the time of how much the farm bill would cost, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, and they look at it in a ten year period, said that it would it would be about nine hundred and fifty six billion dollars in projected spending. And all of that spending, you know, much with USDA's authorities and with the farm bill itself, it's really one of the only truly rural development focused pieces of legislation. And also the farm bill is essentially probably one of the largest funding packages that Congress passes, an authorization package that Congress passes, which is non-defense related. And that includes monies for all food, agriculture, nutrition, infrastructure, but also includes in some of the stuff we're gonna talk about today, uh, credit, housing, community buildings, research, educational opportunities, broadband, and utilities. Uh, the Farm Bill also, even though it's rural focused, does represent a strong partnership between rural and urban communities, and that's within the, that's within the nutrition title itself. Um, however, and that was because a lot of folks at the time that the Farm Bill was pa uh, being passed when the nutrition programs were developed in the, in the mid-70s, uh, a lot of uh, folks in urban areas received uh, food assistance. However, we're seeing those dynamics start to change where we're seeing about 20% of rural households receiving some type of federal food assistance. And we do know that um, over 25% of folks in Indian country also receive some type of federal food assistance. And in many communities, that number can be as high as, as 50, 60%. Um, so when we're looking at why the farm bill matters and what it can bring, and today we're having a, a strong economic development focus and credit focus and research focus, and rural development focus, if you were to take that same number that the, they looked at the 2014 farm bill and look at what the spending for a, a 2018 farm bill would look like over a 10 year period, that could be a $1 trillion worth of development dollars to Indian country into rural areas and to be able to build out some of the much needed infrastructure and components and community buildings and, and other things in those areas. So we think the farm bill holds an incredible amount of opportunity for, for Indian country, for tribes, and for individual native producers to be able to, to, to expand their production. 
Um, and so I think with that, we go on to the uh, next slide. Um, uh, this is the current breakdown of the Farm Bill titles. There's 12 of them. I promise I will not read them aloud. Um, and, uh, and you don't have to memorize them. There isn't a quiz associated with this webinar. But you can kind of see the scope and span of this. And, you know, just for today, we're going to be focusing uh, essentially on titles five, six, uh, and seven, credit rural development, and then research and education. Um, if you can go to the next slide. And then finally, because there's 12 of them, and it's, um, we kind of like to divide them up into five different key areas, and uh, that's business and economic development, infrastructure and community development, uh, natural resources and conservation, health and nutrition, and then of course miscellaneous, which kind of catches the things that cut across all the different title areas, and also uh, things that may not quite fit directly within one. But for the purpose of today's webinar, we're going to be looking at some of the economic development components, infrastructure, and uh, community development. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Maria. Great. Thank you, Colby. Um, so as we mentioned, this bill gets passed through Congress about every five years. And uh, so for our congressional outlook and timing, I'm going to turn it over to Phil Bakershanks to give a brief update about what's happening in Congress. Phil? Thank you, Maria. Um, this will be a brief um, slide because many of you know the, and as Maria mentioned, um, the Senate Indian Committee had focused uh, last month uh, on this with hearings. We have upcoming a uh, hearing in the House Committee on Ag uh, set for February 6, which is a focus on the state of the rural economy. That tracks well with a um, meeting, a summit that the White House just convened, uh, USDA and Interior Departments, both with a lot of activity in rural America, obviously, held a summit, a White House summit on Monday uh, or Tuesday, it was, uh, on uh, rural prosperity. A couple of tribal leaders were participating in that with Secretary Perdue and Secretary Zinke. Um, all of this is to say to you that the Congressional Outlook um, calendar is quickening. Uh, you've heard that uh, before. Um, we've mentioned before election year dynamics certainly do affect uh, how uh, substantive legislation like the Farm Bill reauthorization is handled. And so we are looking uh, for early this year in the first half or so of the year a lot of activity and the chairman of both the House and Senate Ag Committees have both continued to plant a flag and say that uh, they're going to release, mark and release a bill. Um, the secretary for the department has released his guidelines, which were circulated, uh, and, um, and we were disappointed, of course, that tribes were not expressly mentioned in that, but it gives us an opening uh, to make those those uh, messages plainer. Um, the other piece to this, and Maria may uh, be uh, ready to, in a minute, to to say more, but the uh, uh, background of the tax cuts and its impact on the budget, the background of the continuing efforts to um, reduce or constrain growth in entitlement programs like Medicaid, um, has also slopped into uh, the SNAP or food stamp program and there is considerable pressure now to cut and uh, uh, the allocation of money to that that program, which directly impacts Indian country, both through that and the FDIPR food distribution program. Um, there are proposals on the table to make uh, massive cuts to that and to transfer the, the reduced uh, money in the form of block grants to states, which both of which are highly problematic for Indian country, we should see uh, the first evidence of some real specifics on this proposal in the president's budget request, which uh, is due out in in the coming days, sometime before the mid uh, before mid February. So, in the next several weeks, there should be a lot of news and information flowing, both on the congressional uh, time frame for hearing and also the funding. Maria, do you have more to add, please? Thanks, Phil. That was really informative. 
Um, I just wanted to say to anyone who is listening on that filed testimony with the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, thank you for doing that. Um, it's really important that we're uh, making sure that we're on the record um, for, for this process. And uh, the coalition uh, will be sending out updates on um, the congressional outlook um, and all the different moving pieces that are happening here um, because uh, it's the Farm Bill is one of the largest bills that Congress passes, um, so it's so it's not always super easy to understand everything that's happening all at once. Um, so thank you for that, Phil. And uh, next we're gonna go to economic development uh, in the Farm Bill. And for economic development, I think we're gonna go over to Janie sims hip the Director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative out of the University of Arkansas. Janie? Um, actually, is Zach on? Um, yes, I'm on. Okay, Zach, uh, let's let's punt over to you. Sounds good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Zach Ducheneau. I work for the Intertribal Ag Council and uh, live on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, economic development has long been bandied about as the solution in Indian country, <clears throat> dating all the way back to the first mineral and oil developments that have happened in, in Indian country. There have been many other initiatives along the way that have sought to improve the ability of Indians to use economic development to ad address the the inequities that were created by federal Indian policy. We've had uh, hub zones, we've had 8A contracting, we've had, excuse me, We've had uh, payday lending come and go, and we've had, uh, what was the last one, promise zones. None of these have changed the poverty map one bit. If you look at the first map that, that we've got in the slide deck, it's American Indians and Alaskan Natives. You could seamlessly change the title of that slide to most impoverished communities in the country. And it would have a perfect overlay of that and it's directly related to the next slide that talks about low income and low food access. <clears throat> we feel there's an underlying cause here and it and, and it's the one thing that's missing from all of the economic development efforts that have happened previously. We're ignoring our base resource and not trying to develop that and add value to that and we do not have the capital necessary to develop the infrastructure to do that. So in these communities that are low income and low food access, the green communities, there is a significant amount of agriculture products grown in these communities every single year. We've done a lot of work in the last 30 years to improve the ownership and control of the land so that Indians are producing the basic product, but the, the challenge that we face now is to build that infrastructure so that we can turn our food products into food and bring more of our food dollar back to our communities. And you see Alaska is very similarly situated in the next slide. The slide after that is kind of a density map of where the American Indian and Alaska Native operators are. Incidentally, if there's any of you on the phone that still have a hold of your ag census and haven't turned it in, please get it in. The deadline is right around the corner. So we're right up against it in getting effectively counted so that we can get the Farm Bill resources distributed in an equitable manner. We feel like there's still an undercount of about 50% on there. You'll see in the next slide, the current scope of ag in, Indi ag in Indian country, the people in the land, 71,000 native farm operators is actually down from the 2007 census but we feel it's a counting error more so than a attrition on our producers. The number of acres operated is down only slightly. Again, we think that's a, that's a, a counting error as opposed to actual <clears throat> attrition. If you look at the next slide, you'll see why we make that case. The market value of the product sold is 3.2 billion in 2007 and 2012. 
and the net farm net cash farm income is down to 371 million. But let's just talk a minute about that 3.2 billion and the potential economic development impact that could have in Indian country. 3.2 billion is more than the BIA budget in most years and definitely going to be more than the BIA budget in coming years. But that 3.2 billion represents the value of those products sold on the first transaction leaving Indian country for the lowest possible value and they're getting turned into food. If you could roll back to that slide with all of the green reservations on it, they're getting turned into food right next to us. So if you'll take Dewey County, for example, the, the easternmost county on Cheyenne River, if you go just across the river, there's a bunch of people feeding our cattle the grain that they grow, adding value to that. And in their community, you see new car dealerships, you see a John Deere implement dealership, you see several grocery stores and several restaurants. And when you come back over to Eagle Butte, where the where the the exploitive extraction of our effort to develop our natural resource is evident, we've got a used car dealership. And surprisingly enough, the cars that he's getting ready to sell right now amount to what a tax refund is. We've got no implement dealers. We don't even have a farm and ranch store on our reservation. So the lack of the lack of capital to develop the infrastructure to keep more of our income here has a direct relation into the small businesses that we would like to see in our reservation communities that have been too long the major emphasis when we talk about economic development in Indian country. We've got to build that foundation so we can go back into the sequence of our slide deck now. The current scope of Indian country ag production, we talked a little bit about that. The net net cash income per farm isn't enough to live on. And a lot of the, you know, a big contributing factor to that is the nature of credit in Indian country. At our local bank here in Eagle Butte, it's customary for a long-term known customer to be offered a 13% to 17% auto loan for a late model used vehicle. A non-Indian in Gettysburg is going to probably get a 3 or 4% loan for that same vehicle. So that that 14% additional in interest that we're paying erodes at our net cash income per farm, and it limits the amount of money that we have to reinvest in our community and shop at our local stores. The next slide you'll see the sales of crops and livestock by commodity group. And you'll see that Indian country is predominantly grazing and farm ground. Uh, but the, the, other, the other types of crop are, are coming on strong. We've got a growing sector of vegetables and melons, potatoes, uh, nurseries and greenhouses are kind of kind of taken off. But it's mostly grazing animals and it's mostly commodity crops. <clears throat> So when you think about that $3.2 billion market value of, of ag products that are sold, and you go to the slide that's got the food dollar on it, you'll see that that represents the smallest portion of the food dollar way over on the left. Farm and agribusinesses, that's our Native American producers and tribal farms way on the left side of that. It represents 10 cents of every food dollar. We would like to see a study done that breaks that 10% down and shows truly what's getting back to our reservation communities because we think it's something lower than 10 cents. But let's use that number for the sake of argument. And let's say that our goal in the next 20 years is to see every last ounce of tribally grown produce or meat or crop processed one time on the reservation. We're going to triple the amount of economic impact. So we go from $3.2 billion to $9 billion. That is more than the IHS and the BIA budget combined. And it's all within our hands to reinvest in our community. It isn't something that we've got to go and fit within government regulation to access. This is That's true economic development. That's the path to true self-sufficiency and sovereignty. So the, 
that leads us to the credit title. And we spoke a little earlier about the 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 plight with as far as credit goes in Indian country. All of our farm bill priorities with respect to credit sit on the foundation of the need for a study of ag credit in Indian country. We feel, and we've been talking for years about everywhere where there's a food desert in Indian country, there's a credit desert right there alongside of it, on over top of it. And what we define a credit desert as is where a person or a entity cannot get fair and reasonable terms on the credit compared to their counterparts that don't live in that area. And there are any number of contributing causes to that. You know, I, I've read studies from the federal Minneapolis, Minneapolis Federal Reserve that, that allude to the fact that tribal court systems and tribal governments need to step up their game get more modern, pass uniform commercial codes. Well, I live on a reservation that passed the uniform commercial code in 1999, and it's still a credit desert. So we need to examine that issue a little further to shed light not only on what the tribes and the Indians need to do to become better customers, but we really got to take a look at the commercial credit world and see why they continue to stay out of Indian country as a general rule. Give you one quick example. We helped the producer refinance his loan that he had at a at a regular commercial bank. He had borrowed two hundred thousand dollars to buy land. And the bank loaned him the money so they're they they're able to say we're serving Indian country, but what they did to him instead of what a non-Indian would get off the reservation for deeded land. The non-Indian would get 30 to 40 years to pay that loan back, which would make that payment somewhere around eight or $9,000 a year. The Indian who bought trust land from a relative to keep it from going out of trust was forced to pay his entire loan back in six years. So it's the, literally the difference between him having $40,000 to invest in his business or diversify by virtue of getting a fair loan on his land or having to hawk everything that he owned just to keep his agriculture business going. Once we were able to help him get refinanced with fair terms through the Farm Service Agency, through government lending, he was able to diversify and now runs a lumber company in Eagle Butte. So our producers are ready to take that next step if we can just get access to the resources we need to, to make that all work. Uh, we've got some loan statistics there. And what is this next slide? So we've got the number of FSA loan applications there. And you'll see that that overlays pretty well with reservations and credit deserts. And there's a reason. We, we feel like the Farm Service Agency should be the first place that an Indian producer goes to get a loan, not the last place. And right now, the policy and regulation that governs Farm Service Agency harkens back to a time when Indians were an afterthought. So they, it's all written around the non-Indian land ownership, non-Indian participation. So you have policies and regulations that look to push people towards commercial credit first. It's our assertion that until and unless this GAO study on credit deserts in Indian country with respect to agriculture is completed, those regulations and, and policies should be lifted from Indian producers. We shouldn't be forced to look to commercial credit because we know what commercial credit's like. We shouldn't be forced to graduate out of the Farm Service Agency loan programs in 10 years because there's nowhere to graduate to that's fair. So you'll see we've got a slide there that says Indian country opportunities in the credit title. We need to start to build loan products that are suitable to our, excuse me, to our need to start to develop food products again and to, to develop food again instead of food ingredients. So for instance, if someone was raising cattle on Fort Peck, 
and they want to start selling beef instead if we take them into the farm service agency to try to get that loan the farm service agency official is going to just blink his eyes real hard and say but we only do cow loans only for cattle on the hoof so we need to build some latitude in there so that our first stop when we go to look for credit is more amenable to helping us get into food development instead of keeping us in this what we call the commodity cycle where you you have your production you pay all your bills you pay your leases and then you're out of money because you sold your product at the lowest possible price there's a socially disadvantaged interest rate that's set in statute at five percent that was set at five percent at a time when the prevailing interest rate was 12 and we feel like it should be adjusted to, to fit the times. The prevailing interest rate now is four. We had a class action lawsuit in the 90s and the 2000s by Native American producers against the former Farm Home, Farm Home Administration, now Farm Service Agency, because of the discrimination that was happening in Indian country. We were able to get to a settlement in that and get some claims approved but Indians are so reluctant to believe in the federal government's things that seem too good to be true we didn't get the sign up that we thought we did we should we uh, were maybe at a third of the applicants that we thought we would have and the way the lawsuit was settled only those who were successful in their claim were able to have debt forgiveness and participate in the FSA loan programs again. Now our slide here is could be confusing to folks in the FSA, but Indians understand what we're talking about. When we say FSA forgiveness, we're not talking about forgiving their debt. We're talking about just letting them participate again in the loan programs because prior to the lawsuit, if you had debt settlement or a debt write down or negotiated an amount, you were then kicked out of the FSA loan programs. We need to let all of the Indians back in the FSA loan programs. Uh, we talked a little bit about the graduation requirement and private credit denial. <clears throat> we think those are, are archaic notions and contemplate a foreign land as far as Indian producers are going. Excuse me. So I think, you know, to, to kind of sum it up, until we're able to get our native CDFIs stood up and serving with a loan fund that, has a, that is at a level that it can revolve and grow, FSA and other government lending is going to be our best option for our producers. So we need to make sure that we continue to push the envelope with the Farm Service Agency with respect to Indian country ag production so that we can take that next step from owning the assets that are adding the value to our grass or to our soil and building the infrastructure that's going to take those assets to the next level that are going to turn the page on us as far as poverty and economic development. And we like to try to think of a new definition of healthy foods. Part and parcel of healthy foods means it's providing the maximum economic benefit to the community where it come from. And I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Janie for the Rural Development title. Thanks, Zach. Um, I did want to, before we leave the credit title, just wanted to um, make an, an additional point. And Zach always does an incredible job um, going through all of those issues that are so interrelated. but. You know, if you go, and I'm not, um, you don't need to get, take us back there, Maria, I'm just going to um, briefly make reference to it. But um, if you if you think about the, the slide, a few slides back about um, the number or the percentage of um, uh, credit applications from native producers that's been approved, you'll actually see that the numbers have been going up um, that are reportable out of uh, USDA from 2008 on up. But to, to Zach's point, um, 
the the underlying policies that are written into the law and have been part of the Farm Bill law for quite some time are just off as they pertain to tribes and in, and to Indian producers. So, you know, we can continue to see um, increases in the numbers of applicants for FSA loans that are approved and and kind of in the system, but um, we really need to focus on the underlying policy frameworks that are that inform literally how FSA can even write a loan. And that's uh, some of the pretty specific issues that Zach was getting into. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift over to rural development. Um, and although a lot of folks actually think about rural development almost separately uh, from uh, farm credit and farm uh, farm service agency and the uh, loans and loan programs and uh, pro federal programs um, applicable to farming and ranching and food production. Um, the rural development title itself has quite a few mechanisms that are uh, very, very important to um, in, uh, agriculture development and food development in Indian country. Um, rural development is, is literally the only agency in the entirety of federal government that is solely focused on the needs of rural America. Um, if you detected in my voice that I um, uh, am very passionate about this uh, area, you might be uh, correct in assuming that. Um, and I think uh, the importance of tribal leadership and, and tribal producers and uh, tribal citizens around the country of getting into this uh, fray of supporting USDA's program authorities and rural development specifically are real is really important. Um, the the programs that can that rural development itself has uh, responsibility for under the Farm Bill include everything uh, that you can possibly think of: uh, rural business and community facility programs, um, housing, rural housing, rural infrastructure. Um, electric communication services, rural water and sewer infrastructure, rural hospitals and healthcare, and the list just goes on and on. Um, their program authorities in rural development are extremely powerful and they're really calibrated for rural people and places. Um, and quite often the only people who can actually participate in those programs are people who live in rural areas. So making sure that, that that tribes have a, a broader exposure to and um, acquaintance with those programs is very important and that we think about those in terms of how they can uh, better support Indian country is very important. Um, in the last five years, according to Rural Development's own data, uh, they have pushed out um, at over $3 billion in support uh, to Indian country and that Please keep in mind that's not for all of USDA. That is literally for one of the agencies in USDA. And so this, I think sometimes we we don't literally keep in the front of our mind how powerful they can be um, in terms of supporting the infrastructure we need. Tribes do have a historic uh, low usage of rural development. Um, for instance, um, back when I was at USDA. I would go to housing meetings and you know and I was I was always kind of amazed that that the HUD housing programs were the ones you know that we really focused on and I would literally be kind of waving the flag over in the corner <laughs> going going don't forget rural housing over at USDA rural development um that but I think we can improve um those particular um usage patterns uh, the potential for rural development to be a substantial partner with all of our communities and our governments is really, really important. And they do have such a powerful set of tools to help us build out our needed infrastructure um, around water, sewer, broadband, et cetera. If you could go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, the, Three billion we were talking about. Um, our team here pulled, uh, made a little bit more specific uh, approach to how this might look, or, or how it does look in the data. And so you can see in that particular slide, 
you know, we're hitting the housing and community facility programs pretty well and the utilities programs pretty well. We could obviously do better, but we're very low in how we actually access the rural business and cooperative programs. So much room for improvement there that can really help our help develop our food infrastructure as well as the small businesses in our communities that depend or are a part of that whole support system like Zach was talking about. Um, the next few slides, I just we threw them in there so that you can kind of get a sense of, for instance, the home ownership uh, rates for completely rural, rural counties. Um, for those of you on the phone, I'm, this isn't news to you, um, but uh, time and time again, we constantly run into the need for um, housing, but also very specifically need for housing for farm and rural small business owners that help support a food economy. The next slide looks at electric rates um, in our in our areas of Indian country. We we all know that they're uh, normally higher, and this can be a drag on um, on our business development. And um, you know, agriculture and food production is uh, very dependent on having home ownership or housing available nearby, but also um, utilities access as well. The next slide looks at the um, the Americans without access uh, to fixed advanced telecommunications capacity. Uh, the reason why we wanted to you know make a point of this, um, number one, it did show up. Um, it's showing up a lot. There have been, I think there was a recent meeting just this week around um, around wiring the res. Um, I know that that the the White House convening around rural prosperity had an had an e-commerce and uh, broadband discussion. Um, but this data is very very important also to food and to food and agriculture production. Um, it's really essential um, if you're trying to develop a new market for instance, for a new value added product like Zach was talking about that that you that you have access to the to, to these resources so that you can connect to remote markets. It's absolutely essential. And so understanding how we need to fill the gaps on these issues. Um, a lot of folks tend to think that maybe food and farming and ranching only need tractors, but uh, broadband capacity and putting it in the hands particularly of our entry producers and our beginning farmers and ranchers who know how to use these systems way better than I would um, is just really important uh, to to their growth and to our continued growth around our food systems. The next slide, we just picked a few things um, that um, are identified in the report itself um, that are discussed at length there, but that also came up in the hearing that was held a couple of weeks ago around agribusiness and Indian country before the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Uh, one of the areas that came out of a couple of farm bills back was a specific provision called the substantially underserved trust area provision. Uh, right now that law only applies to a small segment of rural development infrastructure programs in the utility service. And, the, and the, the essence of that provision is it allows for waiver of match, it allows for lower interest rates, longer term of repayment, and a lot of uh, priority points as well as other things that would um, allow these programs and authorities to really seep into our areas in, with better terms and in easier ways. And so um, the pushing out, if you will, of that substantially underserved trust area provision to allow those those kind of heightened uh, means of stimulating economic development. Uh, we uh, discussed with the senators there who asked specifically about these issues, um, how, what, how, how is, it, is it possible to push that SUDA provision further and deeper across all of rural development programs Actually, it even came up to push it out throughout all of USDA programs. Another issue that came up um, in the hearing um, and in the roundtable the next day was the, uh, was native CDFI access to all rural economic development loan and grant programs. Um, USDA's uh, portfolio uh, tends to be very eligibility driven for 
a specific um, program authority like everything else is in the federal government. And in some of those eligibilities, um, the native CDFIs aren't specifically listed. And so that issue came up in terms of an improvement that could be made to really push these things out further. Uh, the issue of uh, permanent tribal technical assistance office for all rural development funding authorities came up as a means to literally be the bridge between tribes, uh, tribal producers and tribal businesses into really accessing and understanding how best to use uh, the rural development authorities. Sometimes when you're marching off into a new space of of uh, seeking support from these programs, you need a little bit more technical assistance to actually get you over the hump and learn how to use them and, and really thread the needle. And then clarifying eligibility requirements for all of the RD programs to make sure that there is consistency across the eligibility requirements. Next, I'm gonna turn uh, briefly to research. The research title is extremely important as well. Um, the research title covers um, a wide variety of program authorities. Um, it funds the land grant um, system in the United States. Um, it and that in turn funds uh, basic research, extension services, economic research, um, education in the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. Many of you uh, know of land grant institutions. Uh, but uh, the tribal colleges and universities were uh, granted, um, or a substantial number of them were granted land grant status beginning in 1994. Um, every farm bill thereafter adds to, um, if uh, those institutions are ready, adds to the list of tribal colleges who have land grant status. But making sure that all of the funding authorities, all of them, um, at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and throughout the research title are accessible to all tribal colleges and universities is really an important component. But the research title also provides funding for the federally recognized tribes extension program, which was developed many years ago in order to fill the gap um, of providing uh, specialized services uh, for tribes um, in those areas specifically that weren't serviced by a tribal college or for where there was a specific subject matter need. Um, agriculture programs and youth development programs are needed across the board um, and across the board in Indian country and making sure that we that we grow the federally recognized tribes extension program. Uh, it's been flat flat funded for decades and making sure that all of our um, tribal colleges have access um, in, a, in an equitable manner um, to the programs that the 1862s uh, have access to is also, is, it's, it's, a, it's an important component of growth. Uh, federal uh, food and ag research is critical. Um, it underpins um, a lot of um, food production and agriculture production and the ability to respond to challenges in the system itself of food. Um, and we could, you know, spend an entire two hours talking about the various needs within that area, but not the least of which is really providing some underpinning and support for traditional ecological knowledge, which all of us know is, contributes mightily to the, to the health of our ecosystems but also to the health of us and making sure that that we have some means to continue to support our tribal colleges and our FERTEP programs in these spaces but also others who who are, are taking upon themselves to actually focus heavily on working with us as tribal governments and tribal uh, producers and tribal citizens. So the next two slides we just wanted um, always to give you a visual of where folks sit. Uh, the Federally Recognized Tribes Extension Program, um, that's one of their more recent maps of their locations. And then the next slide is uh, the uh, tribal colleges, the land grant uh, 1994s and their locations. The next slide tries to show you a, um, an array of how revenues come into those institutions. Um, and we just wanted you to see 
uh, and be able to study um, over time and have some, you know, kind of basic data to to reflect upon in terms of the funding mechanisms available. Um, so the research title is extremely important for the agriculture and food, health and wellness, TEK, uh, forestry. Um, there's just such a wide variety of subject matter areas that are funded through the research title. And it's important for us to really keep our eyes on the ball of what kind of funding is received by those who, who specialize and are dedicated to serving us. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, um, this slide really talks a little little bit about the pieces of the um, of the opportunities that were identified both in the report as, as well as came up in our hearings and things of that nature and things we've heard from um, other from tribes who are joining the coalition, et cetera. Uh, this parity in funding for the FERTEP program. Um, up, updated research title funding mechanisms. So there is more equitable um, participation and eligibility for ability to, to participate in those funding mechanisms. Um, and just an overall need to really focus like a laser on, uh, on the what we could do with tribal set-aside preferences among the funding mechanisms at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Some of those funding mechanisms do have some priorities uh, within them, uh, for instance, for uh, socially disadvantaged producers, but it really doesn't get us as far as we need to go. And so um, these set-asides and preferences were have been lifted up and there is quite a bit of interest in doing those. The beginning farmer and rancher development program is critical. Um, it's one of the bigger pieces of funding that focuses on on the development of the next generation um, of producers. Um, the industrial hemp production issue is of importance to many, many tribes right now. The the only means that, that the Farm Bill is actually addressing industrial hemp is through research pieces. Um, and so you you will notice in the report we do uh, make reference to that as but but understanding that right now we're in a policy circumstance that, that really is stalling out the ability to actually focus on that as the next big crop, if you will. And of course, um, Native Youth Focus Grants, we've got to deal with the needs for, of our up and coming next generation of producers uh, because uh, farming, ranching, and food production is just like everything else, people age out. And while we not, don't like to talk about it, if we're getting a little older, it is a reality and making sure that our next generation is prepared is very, very important. Um, Maria, I'm gonna turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Janie. That was really informative on the research and rural development titles. Um, at this point, I wanna open it up for questions uh, from our participants. Uh, we've had a few questions during the course of the webinar that I'd like to address now. Um, a few folks want to know uh, if we can send around the PowerPoint slide to show us tribal leaders and folks at your tribe. And the answer to that is uh, yes, we will be sending out the PowerPoint slides after the uh, presentation. Um, so you'll have a copy of the slides. Um, we will be also putting up uh, this power, the webinar onto NCAI's YouTube channel, um, and that'll be up in the next few days uh, in case you need to rewatch it or send it along to somebody uh, to take a look. Um, and one of our other slides, I think um, Zach or Janie, you would know the answer to this. Uh, someone wants to know, would tribal fishers be eligible for FSA loans or value-added loans for tribal fishermen. Zach, uh, is Zach still on too? Because yeah. we could both take a hand we, at this. This is Zach. I, we've not done any yet in our work with the FSA, but as I understand it, as long as it is a quote-unquote farm to fish and not catching wild fish, so you have to have some stake in the overall management of the body of fish. So I, I think 
to the to the extent that tribal producers are are fishing in a way that is thoughtful for the reproduction for coming years, which is what we do. I think I'd rather have them tell us no, so we've got something to build on than not try. Right, and Same goes and for the, the value added. Yeah, and then the the value added producer grant programs and things of that nature, which are well, and and even. Zach, the local food and the farmer's market, anything that kind of takes the fish and brings them onto land, (laughs) if you will, um, is an area that is um, capable of having some of the program authorities support it. But Zach's right. I mean, some of these areas need to be fixed within the actual language so that the department has a real signal that's clearer than what it is now. Production systems change over time. And this idea that we're kind of fixed and we can only fund things that are happen on land um, is evolving. And so uh, Zach's point is well taken. Um, sometimes folks just don't apply because they think they're going to get turned down. And, and if they could reach out to both of us, both uh, IC's technical folks and, and any support we can give, then we can walk people through some of those pretty technical um, eligibility issues, but on the value added piece, there should be quite a few options available. Great, thank you guys. That was informative. Um, our next question is kind of in that same vein. Um, are there any other programs besides the value added uh, grant available for beginning farmers? This person wants to buy land and build a home. You want to go first, Zach? <laughs> we can both deal with this too. <laughs> you want to buy land and build a home? Uh, they're interested in uh, other programs uh, outside of the value added grant program for beginning farmers. Okay. So the FSA loans have have specific terms for, for beginning farmers and ranchers. And that's that's the place that we naturally fall back into i would definitely have that individual reach out to the native cdfi in their community and if there isn't one look across look across boundaries and and find one that might be in their service area to help them with their endeavor the other thing i'll share too is um you know if you're a beginning farmer or rancher or food or trying to start a food company for instance And beginning doesn't necessarily mean you're young. It means you're just beginning. Um, There has been a deep concern, and it has uh, followed into this current administration, too, about the aging population of of food, uh, kind of writ large. And so if you actually look across all of the department, there's been a heightened um, awareness of the need to actually try to prioritize beginning farmer needs uh, within almost all of the authorities. And so there is a beginning farmer and rancher development program, but there's also um, focus areas in risk management and focus areas in farm service and focus areas in natural resources conservation service and focus areas in ag marketing service. It literally is kind of endless. And the department actually has some really good resources um, on their website that can kind of point people who are wanting to start out in multiple directions. But, you know, I'll offer up again, um, anytime you get stumped or you just have a a question about any of these things, you're welcome always to pick up the phone and call Zach's offices or our offices and we can help walk you through it. But um, because the overall, not just in Indian country, but the overall um, population is, aging in a different way in in, the, uh, in, a, in agriculture there's a there's a lot of focus on beginning farmers right now great thanks Janie um, one more question um, similar to uh, the housing question earlier are section 184 housing programs underneath this farm bill are they, are they, excuse me, are they under this farm bill or underused? Are they authorized by the farm bill? Uh, the rural housing uh, service, which is a part of rural development, has a large portfolio 
of rural housing um, programs. Um, I mean, if if you if if the caller or the questioner wants to email me separately, I'm happy to, or or anybody else on the phone call, I'm happy to direct you and walk you through all of those rural housing components. But um, RD's housing programs do everything from repair to building single family homes to multifamily homes to um, you name it. <laughs> Uh, they have a really powerful portfolio in rural housing, which tends to be underutilized, I will tell you, in Indian country. Janie, let me just chime in there a little bit. The Section 184 loan program under HUD doesn't specifically fall underneath the Farm Bill authorization, but the application of that in Indian country could be examined in our GAO study that we're seeking because I know I know banks that will not do those loans on trust land. And that was the only reason that program was ever developed. So there, there's, a, there's a reach there where we can incorporate an examination of that program with this farm bill. Right. All right, and we have uh, our last question is gonna be on FSA loans. Uh, someone wants to know about FSA loans to buy cattle and ranch, um, does, does one have the chance to pay back in a time frame longer than seven years? Uh, he's been told that there are no, lo no loans longer than seven years. Uh, is there any idea on the time frame of FSA loans for cattle ranchers? Absolutely. So that's a good question. And there are, so the, the maximum term by statute for an FSA farm operating loan, which you would buy cattle with, is seven years. But what you can do is amortize it as though it was a 15-year loan, which will lower your annual debt service and put more money in your pocket to take advantage of opportunities to expand, build your own infrastructure. You'll have a balloon payment due at seven at seven years that you can then refinance with the FSA again for up to three years under current law. But after 10 years, they want to kick you out of the program because you're supposed to graduate to commercial credit that doesn't exist. But there, uh, give that individual our contact information and we can send them a printout that will clearly illustrate the latitude that the FSA has and doesn't regularly exercise or, or let you know about. They can actually amortize the loan out 21 years if they want to, but we got to build in them the desire to want to. All right, uh, one last question. Um, for the Youth Farmer Grant, um, someone has experienced that you, a youth has tried to apply but has been discouraged. Uh, what can we do in that circumstance? Janie? Are you talking about youth loans or or just grants to do the youth the youth loan program has been around for a while um you know Zach and we worked on it together to do improvements of it um at f s a um there was a period of time where um that was fixed in a previous farm bill um that if a youth um had a loan and through no fault of their own defaulted, they they were prohibited from dealing with FSA any time in the future. Uh, that has been fixed. And so, and that was through efforts uh, of IC and, and USDA and NCAI. Um, but um, youth grants is a whole different ball of wax. Um, you know, most of the grant programs uh, that, um, that USDA has that could deal with the needs of youth um, really are. We, you'd need to actually get with someone who can who can get you into into those uh, application systems. They can be sometimes a little complex, but the youth loan program, Zach, you're welcome to zip in here. Um, you bet. I know a lots of areas where those youth loan programs are up and running and chugging along. I'm not sure that people are discouraged per se so yeah and then I'll I'll just add that if we learned anything from keep Siegel, never let someone discourage you from applying 
always tell them I would just as soon apply and have you deny me so that we can build a record of our interaction because what they did in the 80s and 90s was tell the Indian producer when they come to the door, yeah, we're out of loan funds, so no luck. They didn't tell them if you apply now, you'll get in the in the queue so that you're you're on the list for loans as funds become available. So with re- I don't know of a youth, any youth grant program except for the one that the IAC does where we will right. take take a student or a, or a young adult who has worked with our TA specialist to secure an FSA youth loan and we will give them an equity grant for their first year's operating expenses. Now, if they're getting discouraged from that, call me as soon as we're done with this webinar and that will not happen again. All right. Um, we have two last really good questions. I know I said that one was our last one, but <laughs> these questions are really good. Um, uh, Janie, I think you might be the best one for this one. Uh, are there any fact sheets available um, describing the programs that are available for tribes within rural development? Absolutely there are. And um, actually, Zach's offices at IC and our offices can get those to you electronically. Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a um, fairly good um, programs and services document that was done in the last administration at USDA that outlines all of what's currently available. Uh, but yeah, we we both work heavily <laughs> in these areas all the time. And so we can point you to all sorts of resources, not just rural development, but others as well. Right, Zach? Right, <laughs> and the last question, um, does the Farm Bill or USDA have any programs for purchasing land for timber management? Anything about purchasing new lands for timber? I don't see that there's anything new coming in the Farm Bill, but some of the requests that we're making in that forestry title would lend to co-management for tribes and, and tribal entities that could improve their timber management and improve their ability to harvest timber. And I just add to the to the previous comment or the previous question, uh, if you have access to the internet, Google Rural Development Fact Sheets and they'll all yeah. just pop right up. That way you don't have to wait for Janie or I. You know, yeah. if, if you're listening to the webinar, odds are you can find them and then, then you can have pointed questions for Janie or I when you reach out, say, how does this particular program fit with my deal? Plus, um, you know, it's really important to to also think about agroforestry. Um, you know, it's hard to know when you get a forestry question whether somebody's just wanting to purchase land to plant trees just for planting of trees versus planting of trees for actual agroforestry purposes or to, um, you know, diversify the, the the physical landscape of their particular farm. And there's programs all over uh, USDA that can um, help you in that space. And there's actually some grant programs as well. Uh, but, you know, you've got to really uh, get in the weeds, literally, or in the trees <laughs> and figure out exactly what you're trying to do so that we can work with you to actually maneuver um, and understand the program authorities that could be brought to bear. That's the beauty of USDA's portfolio is there's so much um, kind of scattered over multiple interrelated agencies that, you know, you you really don't know what you don't know until you start to unpack what is available in there and how it all fits together. Um, so we encourage you to reach out to, to all of our teams and and continue to stay involved in the coalition and, and improving the farm bill for all of our usage. That's a great note to end on, Janie. Um, I think I'll just head to the next slide about how you can get involved. Um, staying involved in the coalition uh, is going to be really important in the coming months um, as this farm bill uh, really takes shape. Um, if your tribe has not already joined the coalition, uh, we'd ask that you uh, work with your tribal councils to pass a resolution to join the coalition. 
uh, when you join, you'll be able to get our email updates and um, know exactly what's going on. And uh, next, um, we'd ask you to identify your tribe's policy priorities. Um, this is a coalition. We want to hear from you. We want to know um, if forestry is a really big issue on your reservation and not so much um, another title. We'd like to know that. And that can help us advocate better for you. Um, and we do have a survey out there, um, the link at the very bottom of this page, um, and we will be sending out the survey link to all webinar participants um, where you can go in and really see what uh, the priorities are that we've already identified. You can go in and uh, talk more about the priorities that maybe we haven't identified and um, really rank them and uh, give us an understanding of where where you want this farm bill to go and where you want the coalition to go. Um, and after that, we ask you to definitely call and meet with your members of Congress about the farm bill. Um, they're going to be the ones that are writing this farm bill. And if they can put into um, an agriculture committee saying, hey, this is a really big priority for my constituents, the tribes in my district, um, that, that has a better chance of getting included in the final bill. Um, and lastly, uh, at the NCAI Executive Council Winter Session on February 12th, we will be hosting a farm bill session. Uh, Zach and Jamie will be there, um, and they'll be able to answer some of your questions uh, like we did today. Um, and that's going to be a really great session, um, focusing just on our next steps and how we can really make this coalition uh, really impact the farm bill. And um, this is a really amazing opportunity, um, especially considering the timing of where Congress is at. Uh, we're expecting bills to be introduced in the coming weeks, months, and we still have time to shape where this farm bill goes. So we definitely encourage you to come to NCAI um, February 12th through 15th. It'll be in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol Hilton. Um, and you can find more information about uh, our conference online at ncai.org. Um, and with that, i um, like to leave you with uh, our information. You can find out more at the Native Farm Bill Coalition.org. And if you have any questions, email at info at Native Farm Bill Coalition.org. And we will have another webinar the week of February 19th, um, really focusing on the congressional action, the hearing at the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, and developing our priorities. So that'll be the next step. Um, we will definitely email you and uh, make sure that you have all the information to participate in the next webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and if you have any questions, my name is Maria Gibbons at NCAI. And uh, you can get in contact with me or any members of the coalition um, about our next steps. Uh, thank you so much for joining.